grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The basis for today's sermon is, of course, the gospel lesson that we just heard together, the feeding of the 4,000. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, my father has a very unique way of eating an orange. You might eat it the same way, but I've never seen anybody eat an orange this way, ever. First, he gets out his pocket knife, because to him, real men carry pocket knives. Don't tell him that I opt to carry fingernail clippers. Regardless, he takes his knife with him in his hand, takes the orange, and he cuts a hole in the very top of it. He then begins to slurp out the juice. He squeezes the orange and squeezes the orange and drinks the juice and drinks the juice, squeezes the orange some more, until finally, after repeating that same process and all the juice is now gone, he takes his thumbs and puts it in the hole and opens it up and eats the rest. He eats it all, tasting and seeing that the orange is good. Well, that is what I think about when I think about this gospel text. Certainly one that we have all heard so many times before. I wonder if it's even in your stained glass. No, no, no. But you know what I'm saying. We've learned this so many times even from, from children. But I think about my dad and his oranges because there is a lot in this text to squeeze out. A tremendous amount of information that we can glean. With the text already having been read for us, it's like, well, like a hole has already been cut in the top. And upon our very first squeeze, we see the care and the compassion that Jesus has for those who leave everything behind in order to hear him. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, this miracle has happened before. And that was what, again, another one that we know. That's the feeding of the 5,000, or at least 5,000 men. We don't, we don't know the number of women and children. Yet that feeding was for folks who were merely curious. They were interested more in Jesus' healings and, of course, his miracles. They were just really, in a way, coming out to see the show. They only spent the day with Jesus. They weren't far from their cities. They weren't far from their homes. And after eating, most of them didn't stick around much longer. This crowd's just a little bit different. They left things behind. They journey into the wilderness, and they're with Jesus for three days. And they're there for no other reason than to hear him to learn from Him, to receive eternal life from Him. You can think about Martha and Mary. It's the, really the same story. You know it well. Martha, who's so terribly consumed with all of the details of, of being the host, or the hostess, rather, at this meal. And then, of course, Mary. All she's wanting to do is concentrate on what Jesus is saying. The group here is like Mary. The feeding of the 5,000, that's kind of like the Martha crowd. But this is the Mary crowd, sitting at the feet of Jesus, not even realizing that they've run out of food. And they won't be able to make it back home, Jesus says, without fainting, without collapsing. Yet the nature of God is compassion. Compassion is a word that it has to do with your gut. I remember this when my children were young. You've been there before. Children are young. They demand all your attention all day long. You finally get them in, in the bath and into their pajamas. They finally go to sleep and you go in to check on them. Lord, have mercy, you don't want to wake that child up. But I remember so many times looking in to see one of my children, and there was a feeling that I would get right there in my gut. It's the weirdest thing. Where's that coming from? That's compassion. 
your gut, your bowels are moved towards someone else. That's what the word means. Jesus had compassion, seeing the people as sheep without a shepherd. He says, I have compassion. I'm feeling something here for these people, for this multitude, because they have now continued with me for three days and have nothing to eat. And as a result, everything turns out fine for those who stay with Jesus. For they trust Him to take care of them, and He does. He has the people sit down and wait, and they're passive. They receive with empty hands. And this is such a lovely picture of not just the church, not just our Lutheran liturgy, but also the gospel itself. It reminds me of the stained glass here. Sure, that's a picture of Jesus in His ascension, but His hands are out. He's giving. And we are doing what? Receiving. We do nothing. Nothing but receive and Jesus is the one who does all the work. Well, the compassion of Jesus did not end there. Jesus' compassion, as you know, took him all the way to the cross where he died, not only for the people that he fed that day, but for all of you as well. Compassion. It's the same compassion. It's never changed. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Same compassion. That is the nature of of our God. Well, going back to our orange analogy, upon our second squeeze of the gospel this morning, Jesus was not joking when he said, We do not live by bread alone. Now, look, we need bread. But more importantly, we need a steady diet of God's Word. Now look, reading the Bible on your own, that is no easy undertaking. And this is why the church has referred the beginner in the Christian faith to the preached word where it is explained and expanded upon. The preached word is always easier to assimilate than the read word. However, most of you are not beginners in the faith and this is why my exhortation to you this morning is to either A, read your Bible, or B, continue to do so. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, in order to do that, you've got to have a plan. Believe me, I've created more plans and failed at them than <laughs> probably all of us combined. But you've got to have a plan. You've got to determine a time and determine a place and have all your things there that you need, whether it's your devotional literature, whether it's your Bible, whatever the case is. It all needs to be right there. And stick to that plan. People do reading the Bible in a year. I've tried that, and it's great if you're into that sort of thing. But my experience is it's just not possible for most folks most of us need longer than just a year. The goal of our reading is not for us to get through the Bible. The goal of our reading is for the Bible, of course, to get through to us. Because why? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. And so I won't squeeze on that part of the gospel too much longer there. But especially for you young kids, you young ones, don't just think that reading your Bible is for mom and dad or grandpa and grandma. No. Get into God's Word now. Right? Are you with me? Yes. Okay, good. Get into God's Word now. And my other little thing on that is don't read it on this. Get a real Bible with these things called pages and read it and read it and mark it and inwardly digest it. Well, with our last squeeze of the gospel text, we recall how Jesus does miraculous things with food and drink. 
You know, back in the Exodus wanderings, God fed those who were making their way to the promised land with manna from heaven and water from the rock. Now this one who can make seven loaves feed thousand, he can and is present with his body and blood in bread and wine. Isn't that amazing? Every time we come together to celebrate the divine service, it's almost like the miraculous feeding is done over and over again. This miraculous provision for the body ultimately points to the miraculous provision for our very souls. The Lord's Supper, communion, the Eucharist, the sacrament of the altar, it's all the same thing. And Jesus gives it to us for the same reason that he gave the food to them. He fed them that day because he knew without his help they would perish. And he gives us his supper for the very same reason. He knows that we're dying. And he knows without his help, without the forgiveness of sins, without life and salvation that only he offers, we too would perish and perish eternally. All right, so following my father's orange eating method, after all the squeezing and all the slurping up we can from this gospel text, what is left for us to do? We eat, we taste, and we see that the Lord is good. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise for the